Ciao, Mike. Ciao, buongiorno. Uh, buongiorno e buona Pasqua. Buona Pasqua. Sono contento di essere qui con te oggi. Spero abbiamo una buona conversazione. Va bene. <laughs> Io sono Roberto Angotti. I'm Roberto Angotti for FIPS. This is Mike Piazza, Team Italy manager. Ciao a tutti. Blessed to have you in the house today. So good to be here. Lovely the reunion. Me. You know, it's just always a pleasure to see you. I saw you last year, you along with the late and great Bill Holmberg in Rimini at Cone 6 2020. Mm. Now, here it is, Cone 6 2021, preparing for the key moments with Mike Piazza. And today is a key moment, you know, yeah. your introduction. And we are going to be talking about some of the mental toughness involved in the game. And we just wanted to let viewers know that you are no stranger to the Italian baseball and softball convention. You've appeared several times. You want to bring us up to speed on the various uh, conventions you've been at previously prior sure. to this one? Well, I, you, people may or may not know, I've been an intimate uh, partner with the Italian Baseball Federation, Softball Baseball Federation since 2006. Um, it was one of the last years I played in the major leagues, but it was the first year of the World Baseball Classic, and it was the inaugural year of the World Baseball Classic. And um, It was something for me that I really uh, was special because I remember as a child how proud uh, my father was of his Italian heritage. My father's from families from uh, Shaka, Sicilia, and he was always so um, engaging with Italian culture, something he was so proud of. And we're very happy and proud to be American, but he never let go of his connection with Italy. So when the classic came around, I thought, i was a little older in my career, I was a little bit past my prime, but I thought I can really help spread baseball throughout the world if, if I played for Italy. So made some inquiries about it and was able to play in the inaugural event with Italy and, and I thought we had a really good showing for the first time. And uh, through that connection they said, look, would you mind being a friend to Italian baseball? I said, I'll do whatever I can. So a few years later I was fortunate to um, help them uh, win two European championships. The aforementioned Bill Holmberg was, uh, and I became very close friends and um, we helped them uh, have two really good showings in the European championships. We went to a World Cup in Panama, didn't do as well. We had a World Cup in Italy, didn't do as great as well, but, but ultimately I feel like we made some, some big steps in growing the game. Mm -hmm. Well, we want to dedicate this program to Bill Holmberg in heaven. And spiritually, I know he's here with us today because he was the one that introduced me to you. And I feel as though uh, he's the reason why you are involved right now as, as the manager for Team Italy. Yeah, I mean, part of it is to honor his legacy. And I think naturally we have inspiration to try to, to make a good showing for Bill. And Bill was, um, was a baseball man through and through his whole life, uh, originally from, from Chicago area and then making his way down to Miami and Columbus High School and um, playing in the Italian League and, and starting a family in Italy, meeting his wife, Gabriella, and, and growing his family over there and becoming Italian. I mean, mm -hmm. it was interesting because Bill and really identified as an Italian. He was Italian. He was, uh, that's where his home was. That's where his heart was. And his passion was to grow the game uh, in Italy, and and he the results are are unquestioned. I mean, he really contributed, had many players signed uh, into the minor leagues. Probably ultimately only because of his efforts and his ability to teach. He was a teacher, number one, mm -hmm. and um, his passion um, and his way of motivation as well was 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 very subtle, very nuanced. Mm -hmm very sublime. He was a mm -hmm. sublime teacher. He, he studied the craft of, of pitching, particularly and in, 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 uh, specifically, but also was great with my son. I mean, he was playing catch with my son. And it was amazing how some people have this ability to connect with kids, and that's mm -hmm. what he, he did. 
Yeah, well, talking about teaching and coaching, uh, you have mentioned that listening was one of the most important things you can do as a player to a coach. From your own experiences, is that valid? Well, I think it's a fleeting quality in this day and age. And I remember um, coaches as a, as a kid, and one of them said to me, Mike, you're, you're going to go well. He goes, you, you know how to close your mouth. Mm -hmm. You know how to listen. You're gonna mm -hmm. you're gonna make you're gonna do something in life because um, learning is listening. Listening is learning and asking questions. And I think sometimes, you know, one of my coaches said the the only stupid question is an unasked question. Don't be afraid to to not be informed or not not know what the answers are. And I think today we're so insecure about. Um, not knowing or, or not understanding, but the only way you're going to learn is you have to, to ask and you have to, to listen and you have to absorb the information. And sometimes it's not on the first time. Mm -hmm. And I think um, for me, talking and stories are just as important as instruction and drills. Mm -hmm. And your style of management is a family style of management from my observation in the classics. Uh, everyone was treated as an equal and as a, an active participant, even if they were sitting on the bench or in the bullpen waiting for their turn. Absolutely. I mean, I learned that from Tommy Lasorda. I mean, Tommy Lasorda's style of managing was that we spend more time when we're on a team training and we spend sometimes more time with our own family. So we are a family, an extended family, and we all have a role and no role is, is, is insignificant. I mean, because a team uh, has to have uh, certain characters step up that mm -hmm. wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily be expected to execute in situations, whether they're big pressure situations or not. So everyone has a role, and the only way to be successful is, is, uh, is everyone to get behind uh, a common goal mm -hmm. and, and enjoy the idea that... that you are part of something that is bigger than yourself. Yeah. Well, often I see letters composed by Italians and they end with un abbraccio, a mm -hmm. hug. Mm -hmm. And that was the connection that Tommy brought to baseball. There were very few managers that would let them get so close to you. And that's what he, he humanized the connection between player and coach. That's a good point, and I think the, one of the, the sad things today is, at least from what I've seen, things are so corporate, you know, I, I, in, in situations and teams today, it, it, it just, things are so corporate, and Tommy was, it, it was a family, you know, we, we, we eat together, we train together, we, we, we sleep together, we, 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 we fail together, we succeed together, and, and I think ultimately um, those trials and tribulations of, of going through the season of a, of a bunch of guys trying to achieve greatness is mm -hmm. what uh, the quest, so to speak, is, is, is the fun part. And how could you not become close? And I think unfortunately today, we have some great technology, we have social media, we have ways of communicating, which we never had, mm -hmm. I mean, up until 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but the sometimes unintended negative consequences that it pulls us apart, it doesn't really, you have moments where you can sit down. I mean, I remember in the minor leagues, sometimes we'd, well, guess what? We'd all throw some money and go get a, a case of beer and, you know, have a few beers after the game and talk about the game. Hey, why did you do this? Why did you do that? What did you learn on this play? What were you thinking on that? And then you start to, to learn that way. Now it's, everyone just goes, you know, mm -hmm. everyone's on their phone. And, and I hope that we are able to sort of recapture that feeling of community especially after the pandemic, you know, when things get back to normal, that we just enjoy being social creatures and, mm -hmm. and especially being part of a team. Yeah, and Tommy loved his ancestral heritage, uh, Tolo, where his family was from. Abruzzi. Yeah, and, and Fullerton, yeah. California, his hometown. I've been fortunate enough to speak with both mayors of Tolo and Fullerton, and I'm trying to bring them together for a sister city relationship in the honor of the legacy of, of Tommy Lasorda. It's I thought you, you'd be happy to hear that. I so. love, I mean, I love uh, Brutz. I've been through there several times now that, you know, I've been living in Italy and went to Pescara a few times, which is in Abruzzi. And, uh, 
No, it's it's a it's a wonderful region, and um, you know, Italy, Italy's a wonderful country. I mean, I've, it's been so much fun for me to to spend time there and get to know, you know, not just my heritage, but you know, the history of the country as well. Mm -hmm. And I know the coaches need help in those different regions where baseball isn't as popular. So I know that you've been on some MLB Goodwill Ambassador tours, going to different regions, working with players and coaches to educate them. And that's one of the main things we're going to miss most about Bill is his ability to organize these camps and, and bring players out. And uh, I went to an event, uh, I think it was last summer, obviously, before the pandemic, and it was up in uh, Ronki, Redi Puli area, and we had a, a Major League Baseball MLB endorsed uh, camp where mm -hmm. we bring the kids out and we run them through drills. You know, we make we time them in the in the the 60 and um let them hit let them feel let them throw see what their skills are and you know part of it is that uh, it, it's baseball is so, so many uh, sort of um minutia things that you have to monitor with kids if they're mm -hmm. if they're doing something wrong it's very difficult to to check it and put them on the right path because you know other sports are not as sort of intricate you know mm -hmm. there's not so many different skills you have to have and strategies and defenses and offensive you know it's pretty simple as, as compared to uh, to other sports but when I noticed some things I was like you know who's teaching these kids we need to get on the same page and have sort of a, a, a understanding that we have to teach hitting this way we have to teach throwing this way and then eventually as you grow you become you sort of get your own style mm -hmm. but but you have to be strong in the fundamentals it's like uh, you can't really in 99 percent of the case you can't be a great musician if you don't read music you know mm -hmm. you have to have the fundamentals and then you're able to sort of adopt and grow uh, your own style right and stress management after you've broken it down the fundamentals of the game that's something that really you know, a yoga instructor or somebody outside of the game or a mental skills coach, you know, addresses. So do you view pressure situation as a positive opportunity to stand out? Yeah, I was, I had the gift, I think, of, of focus. And um, I think if you're a player and you're having, you get nervous in those situations and you press and you have anxiety, you have to find a way to sort of train yourself to become more focused in those situations. And for me, I would use any tool. I mean, even the most rudimentary, elementary type of things, like I remember something very simple that I taught about being, when I was on the on-deck circle and I was becoming in a pressure situation and I felt the game growing and the anxiety, I believe it or not, would think of like a tiger in the wild and I tell kids that and they think it's funny you know and I go no 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 like that worked for me like I would think about like a, you know those 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 uh, wildlife shows as a kid or you know what we used to watch a, mm -hmm. a tiger stalking his prey or a cheetah or a leopard and I would have that image in my mind and that would calm me down you know that I that that sort of feeling of a tiger creeping and stalking his prey mm -hmm. and it just allowed me to relax or a song mm -hmm. a certain song that I enjoyed that was able like to relax me mm -hmm. and if it broke I would do something else I mean you got you have to be flexible you have to be fluid you can't really sort of rely if this isn't working you have to try something else and so those tools of visualization and then confidence like for me I would say to myself I want to be in this situation I mean, this is what it's all about. You know, don't shy away from it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, the player, the defense, when, when I was in Little League, you know, the coach used to say, when we used to get ready, he goes, say to yourself, I want the ball hit to me, not I hope the ball doesn't get mm -hmm. hit to me, you know? Mm -hmm. So train yourself. And confidence then comes through working, mm -hmm. execution, and a little bit of luck too. You mm -hmm. know, that ball you hit that stays fair and instead of going foul. I mean, those things start to go in your favor when your energy is positive and you're confident. Is it true that pressure makes diamonds? Absolutely. I, I tell kids all the time when I teach, um, recently talked to the Mets minor leaguers um, last spring training, and I said, you have to train yourself to say, I wanna be that guy in that situation. 
And the reason why I was able to have more success in those situations was before the game, during the game, I was always thinking. It wasn't sort of sprung on me in a surprise. Before the game, I would say, okay, seventh inning, it's going to be two on, two out. This guy's going to be pitching. He's going to throw me this. And I would run that. I would prepare. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, I, I love this expression. It's like, hope is not a strategy. You know, it's like, and, and Reggie Smith, who was one of my first hitting coaches, said, a, a bad plan, I'll clean it up. A bad plan is better than no plan at all. So have a plan. Mm -hmm. And when I was teaching one time, a kid popped up with, you know, two guys on. And mm -hmm. I said, what were you thinking there? Uh -huh. I said, what, what were you trying to do? And he said, honestly, I have no idea. <laughs> I said, that's an honest answer. I go, well, we have to work on that. I said, you have to go up there and think about what you're trying to do. Don't just close your eyes or, you know, just, just hope you get a hit. You know, mm -hmm. think about what you're trying to do. So preparation is, is important. And I think once you prepare, it's like 80% preparation, 20% lock. Mm -hmm. Then after that, if you do the right things, those balls will start, start dropping. Mm -hmm. But you're also going to fail. That's part, of, that's part of life as well. Yeah. Talking about Reggie Smith, he was a protege of Ted Williams. Yeah. Who you had the opportunity to meet in when you were... 15, 14 years of age, he was able to come visit you. Um, and so that Ted Williams style of hitting has been passed on through Reggie Smith onto you. So what was the, the lesson learned as it was passed on this information to you as far as how you assimilate some of the information that these legends have passed on? Well, I think the, the, the really, really good teachers are the ones that can take a seemingly difficult task and break it down and make it simplify it. And I think that's what Ted Williams did. Now, of course, he had incredible ability, incredible eyesight, incredible instincts, incredible confidence, um, worked on his swing for, for, for thousands of hours. But... Ultimately, to explain it, to communicate it, you, his three keys, very simple. I remember very clear. Number one is get a good pitch to hit. So when I tell kids all the time, you got to hit a strike. He, he got it. You got to get a strike. You can't be swinging at bad pitches. Sounds simple enough. Number two is you got to have a quick bat. Your swing has to be, be toned. Your swing has to be in, in tune. Mm -hmm. um, if you're doing something mechanically wrong, you're not going to be successful. And number three is proper thinking. The thing I was just talking about, research, watching a guy, watching a guy warm up, mm -hmm. what a guy does in situations, what he throws. Uh, now we have a ridiculous amount of information on what players do and pitchers do in situations. And now, But you still have to decipher it and take and say that you don't get paralysis from analysis where you start thinking too much. And mm -hmm. so you have to be able to take the information and then sort of weld it down into a a strategy you can execute on. Yeah. So how can one come through in the clutch when the pressure is on? As I said, number one, you want to be in that situation. That's the first thing. You can't say, oh, you know, I, I hope I get a hit here. I, oh my God, I hope uh, you know, it's, it's not me. I hope Mike comes up in that situation. So number one is you got to say, I want to be the guy. I want to be the guy with the game on the line. Train yourself all the time to say that. This is what you want to be because this is why you're doing what you do. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't like the pressure, if you don't want the pressure, then maybe you should think about doing something else. Mm -hmm. Number number one, a desk job. Or exactly. Something. It's and and so you say to yourself, I want to be the guy in that situation with the game on the line. For pitchers, I want to be the guy with the ball in my hand when I gotta get an out when the game's on the line. Mm -hmm. That's that that's number one. Number two is your research knowing what you're up against, mm -hmm. knowing what you need to stay away from, knowing what you can do, knowing what you can't do, mm -hmm. knowing your strengths and weaknesses. And number three is just, just execution. Go out and do it. Right. So it's like a living laboratory, this ballpark. All these different things are happening pregame, the bullpen activity, and even practices. Were you privy to watching the other teams practice in, in Major sure. League Baseball? All the time. Yeah, I would go out and watch their batting practice, and uh, would now they have video or I don't <laughs> with the video 
um, controversies now. There's, but but I'm sure the video's on, so we can even sit there and have a pregame meal or 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 get get loosened up and, and watch what you know who's doing what. Scouting reports, breaking it down: who's hot, who's not. You know what what to look for, who they're bringing in in big situations, who's their go-to guy when they need to get a good hitter out. So you know all these things that it, it, the more you become experienced and the more you you do what you do, they start to become more natural. Yeah, you know, it's not as it's 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 a routine you have to get in, and a routine to me is is important because. It's been proven with kids. You know, kids love routine. Kids love getting up. They like going to school. It's it's something that gets them into the 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 way to learn. And mm-hmm. same thing in in anything. I mean, in a desk job or any job that you have to have a routine. You have meetings. You have executions. You have research, and then you go out and do your task. So you become sort of like a hawk, a mile out looking for prey, and just zeroing in on on what your pregame activities that's are. a great analysis yeah and always hungry you know it, it never never be satisfied you you always have to be for me i was fortunate because they always say well how does a slow slow uh, footed catcher hit you know 309 his career over 16 years and that's like i was never satisfied i was if i had one hit i wanted two if i had two hits i wanted three if i had three hits i wanted four if four hits, i wanted five that's just that if I had three hits in a game, that fourth at bat, I, I and I made it out. I was I was mad. I wanted those four hits. Well, let's take a step back mm-hmm. to Wrigley Field, major league debut. You mm-hmm. did some spectacular things. Can you walk us through that day? Yeah, it was funny. I mean, my first at bat in the big leagues, I was I was facing this guy. He was a big. He was actually from Fullerton. I think his name was Mike Harkey, six mm-hmm. six, big, hard throwing guy. So it was my first big league game, and I said, you know what? I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a pitch. I'm not going to get anxious and swing at the first pitch in my first big league at bat. I ended up walking because I was just like, I'm going to take a strike. I ended up walking my first big league bat, which to me is sort of emblematic of my career because I, I just decided to be patient. And then the next at bat, I was like, okay, if he puts one over the plate, I'm going to ambush him. And, and I did. I ended up getting my first big league hit. Actually... Probably could have had a triple if I really pushed it, which would have been pretty crazy trivia if you think about my first big league hit was a triple. I went to the gap and kind of stayed in the wall. I was coming around second. I said, eh, I better not. I don't want to get thrown out sure. of the on, on my first big league no hit. Doubt. So I pulled up at second. So yeah, and ended up going my first four for four in the big leagues. So I had three hits that day. And then my first hit uh, in Pittsburgh the next day was off uh, Randy Thompson, the left-hander. So I went four for four in my first uh, big league at bats. Well, I think you tipped your hat off to your ability early on. And I know yeah. that Tommy Lasorda was instrumental in yeah. you being drafted and for him to get that confirmation that you were the guy must have been huge. Yeah, it was, it was fun. I, and, and, you know, again, I had a, a really amazing journey. I, I from, from young and, and not getting drafted out of high school, which was frustrating to me, coming down to the University of Miami on a scholarship, not playing, going to Miami-Dade um, Junior College, getting drafted late by the Dodgers, uh, almost, I mean, walking away from the game, you know, to my second minor league season, just wasn't having any fun, getting called back by Reggie Smith and going to Mexico. I mean, I played in Mexicali and, and really enjoyed the, the winter league there and grew and matured. And um, the guys I met along the way and the, the stories and the coaches and just, it was, it's a, it's a journey. You can't, uh, you can't, uh, you can't make it up. It was just something for me that, uh, that I'm just so very blessed. And your story is documented in long shot your book Mm -hmm. yeah that was fun and so now you know people can immerse themselves into your your life story and i think there's gonna have to be a new chapter now with your experience with team italy because i think we're going to rewrite history with the upcoming world baseball classic well that's the plan i mean obviously we've had some setbacks with with uh recent years with the pandemic last year but uh yeah, look, I mean, the passion is there. I think the, the, the people that involved in the national program, they really love the game. They want to grow the game. So, look, it's, uh, we've got a lot of work to do, though. I yeah. mean, it's never easy. 
I mean, teams are, even up until 15 years ago, I mean, now uh, you have teams that are better that you wouldn't really think that would be on the world stage getting better. Some of the Eastern Bloc countries, France is getting better, Spain's getting better. Um, obviously, Holland's always been a strong team. Germany has very good athletes. So it's, uh, it's, it's a big task. Yeah, you know, we, it's never a cakewalk. Yeah, we can't be running in place, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Forward. That's it. You know, but should one not try to do too much and focus what you can control? Absolutely. I, I think um, you have to look at it to where you, you look, you, you, baby steps are important too. And, and you have to be pragmatic. And realistic too. I mean, I, I think you get into yourself into trouble when you start looking at too many big picture things and not getting into just simple tasks, like you said, that you can control. And um, growing every day. I mean, learning something every day, whether you win or lose, whether you're successful or you fail, that's part of the process. And I think you have to really try to pull something out of, of your lesson every day. Mm -hmm. Taking care of yourself. You know, doing the basic things always work well for me. Mm -hmm. Getting your rest, eating well, taking care of yourself, getting into the training room if you need help or mm -hmm. you need some treatment. Those are things that, I mean, some guys don't do and it costs them. I mean, I tell people all the time, when I was in the minor league, I mean, there was a lot of guys more talented than me. There was guys that could hit the ball farther than me. I mean, I hit the ball far, don't mm -hmm. get me wrong, and I was a good hitter. Obviously, guys that could run a lot faster than me, guys that had better arm them in, they fell away because they lost their focus. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a shame because some of them were, could have been very good major leaguers. Mm -hmm. So if we break it down, it should be just a pitch-by-pitch pitch approach and staying in the moment, staying in the present and, and winning that pitch. Absolutely. I mean, and that's the, the ability. I mean, people... A lot of guys, and I wrote this in my book, I mean, they remembered me for my temper as far as that if I didn't execute the way I w thought I should, I would be very upset. And look, as a young kid and you're unchecked, you know, you, you do have to manage your temper. I mean, I was able to watch great players, how they dealt with failure, and I was able to mature that way and evolve. Uh, but still, you have to have that fire. You can never be happy with... Uh, with, with failure, you always have to want to, to execute and to be successful. Mm -hmm. And you earn some nicknames as a result of that yeah. hot temper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We used to have, uh, well, Mitch Webster, when I was a, when the Dodgers, they used to call him Snapper, and I kind of, you know, like a snapper turtle, and snap means like you have a, you know, a, a, you, you freak out or you have a, 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 an episode of extreme. Uh, 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 where you're uh, uh, furious by not uh, coming through throwing helmets. And I threw a helmet one time. It was so funny. It, it wasn't funny, but I threw it, and it kind of hit this ledge, and it came up, and our trainer, Bill Bueller, literally it skimmed his head going, like, you know, pretty quick. It could have knocked him out. So I was like, uh-oh, I better stop this. But even though that is something you don't advise, the, 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 uh, the energy or the, the initiative, the will to want to succeed, is important, but you got to be careful. You don't want to hurt anybody to hurt yourself. But that shows your passion for the game. It meant something to yeah. you. Yeah. Well, they told me a story too. Frank Howard years ago, actually, he made an out and he went to go hit his elbow on the bench and I think he missed and he hit the wall and he hurt himself. Hmm. And he was out for a while. He had a, he hurt his arm pretty bad. So, yeah, I mean, you got to be careful. I mean, for me, um, you don't see it as much as now. I think, you know, maybe it's just, maybe it's positive learned behavior, but um, you, you don't see those those outbursts as much, but as I said, you have to be careful. You don't want to hurt anybody or yourself. Well, as opposed to the days when you played, like these strikeouts, if a guy strikes out over a hundred times now, it, so long he can hit the ball over over the fence, it's sort of accepted. So maybe they just play off the strikeouts now because so many of them happen as opposed to back in the day. What was it? You never struck out more than 65 times yeah, in a close, season? Yeah, close to that. Yeah. yeah, I hated striking out. I, didn't, I, I put the ball in play. It was weird. I mean, when I see some of the philosophy today of a strikeout is just another out, and if you put the ball... It doesn't make sense to me. I'm trying to figure out where this is coming from because 
If you, for example, the difference between hitting 250 and 300 in 100 at bats is five hits. If you think about it. So 25 for 100 is 250, 30 for 100 is, is, is 300. Mm. So out of 70 plus at bats, 60 plus at bats, you can't get five more hits. Mm -hmm. Why would you not want to? I mean, if you're striking out X amount of times, you put the ball in play, you can get some hits. Mm -hmm. It's really weird to me. I, 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 that's one thing I do not jive with the new era of strikeouts are not important or it's just another out. I'm like, really? Put pressure on the defense. Hit a mm -hmm. hard ground ball. Mm -hmm. um, I, don't, I don't get it. That's one thing I just, I'm, it's, it's sort of mysterious to me. <laughs> well, if one has a golden sombrero, three strikeouts, how do you blank that out as you go into the batter's box your fourth time? Yeah, no, I mean, I struck out four times, actually one time in a game. I'll never forget it. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. I, I think the fact that they've decriminalized the strikeout. I mean, years years ago when I came in, if you struck out 100 times, they would think of you, you can't hit. You would go right back to the minor leagues. And now it's like, well, as long as, as you said, if you hit 25 home runs and drive in X amount of runs or you get a certain amount of walks, um, your on-base percentage is this, they don't care. So, mm -hmm. you know, it is what it is. Okay, but... The game is a game of failure, but you do have success. So visualization is key. Before you go to the plate, are you visualizing those success stories as you approach the batter's box and have like a Bob Marley attitude with some positive vibrations? Mm -hmm. For me, is no. I broke it down. I just want to hit the ball hard. I think if I squared, squared up the ball, hit a line drive, <clears throat> that was a successful at bat for me. So I never necessarily thought about where the ball was going. I just knew that if I struck the ball properly, I was going to be successful more, more often than not. Yeah, you're gonna, the big league defenses are great. So you're going to hit some balls hard that guys are going to catch. That's just natural. But if you can hit the balls like four balls hard a game, you're going to get your hits and you're going to get your RBIs and you're going to get your home runs. So by recognizing and acknowledging that the fact that pressure is being created by the player, that's the first step in addressing that issue, yeah? As far as knowing that it's self-induced. Sure. Oh yeah, pressure is self-inflicted in, in, in everything you do. It's, the, it's sort of this anxiety, I guess, to, to fear uh, failure. But what also, fa fear is a good thing. Fear is a motivator. So I never really had problem with that. I mean, as a player, I also played out of fear. I feared of looking bad. Mm -hmm. no, one wants, no one wants to look bad. I mean, that's a motor. If, you, if you're not sort of concerned with, with the appearance of, of looking bad, then that's not good either. So fear of embarrassment. <laughs> Absolutely. Right? And when you got traded to the Mets, you said, I want to be on that stage. Yeah. So... Obviously, you said bring it. That was an evolution because when I first got to New York, it was a change in culture for me. I mean, playing in L.A. and living on the beach and, and going from sort of uh, Chavez Ravine and, you know, the, the beautiful weather to, to New York where it was humid and gritty and I was pressing. I wasn't quite myself. I mean, I was getting a few hits, but I wasn't really driving in big runs or getting big hits. And then there just came a time where I said to myself, I'm here for a reason. And I can either, either I'm going to succeed or I'm going to fail. And if I fail, it is what it is. I'm not afraid of that. So I better enjoy this moment here and do what I can to want to be in New York City. And I was able to turn it around. I was able to, to have a good eight years there and really enjoyed my time. But it's a pressure cooker. It's not easy. Oh, absolutely. It's not easy. And at the end of the eight years, I actually was fortunate to play one year in San Diego. And that was kind of what the, just what the doctor ordered for me. I <laughs> right. was like, let me get back to the West Coast and had a really fun year, 2006. It was one of my, my fun seasons that I really enjoyed playing for Bochi and, you know, some really good teammates, Trevor, Trevor Hoffman and, and guys like that. So it was fun. Yeah. In fact, you've had a plethora of managers that you've worked under. And, you know, baseball being a thinking man's game, who really did you respect if, if you want to point one or a couple out? What attributes did they possess that you hope to bring 
as manager to Team Italy? Great question. My, I don't necessarily know if I have a style, managerial style, but I do have a certain a collection of, of lessons, I guess, from the managers I played with. I mean, Tommy, we mentioned Tommy Lasorda, Bobby Valentine, played for Bobby in, in New York, and he, he had some idiosyncrasies that I wasn't quite jiving with all the time, but generally he was a very smart baseball guy. He knew talent. He knew what guys can do. He was a very good game manager. As far as in-game manager, he was never um, he was never surprised by a situation or, or unprepared. Mm -hmm. Now um, he's a big personality, and he was uh, you know would would definitely play mental judo with you at times. <laughs> um, but it was what it was, and I never had a problem with the manager as long as I played hard and kept my nose down and did what I had to do and was asked did what I was asked to do. Mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned earlier with Bruce Bochy, Boch was great. I really enjoyed playing for him. Mm -hmm. He was awesome. I mean, at the end of April, I think I was hitting like 150 or 130 in San Diego, and he took me in for a meeting and goes, hey, big boy, I'm going to sink or swim with you. He goes, you're, you're, you're going to be fine. I know you can do it, and it was. he just gave me this confidence boost and I was able to really just relax and I went to Chicago I think I was like nine for 12 in the series and mm -hmm. I just really was able to to relax and and come through and have a, a really good year so those short and concise messages seem to be effective rather than somebody just pounding you on the head for 30 minutes those little words of wisdom you embraced and and sort of had a, a mental uh, effect. Where it's true, and it's funny. You know, and it's amazing how like life reinvents itself again and again and again. I mean, I just my daughter had a good. She made a joke because there was something on her social media about why do I when I ask my parents a question, why do I get a lecture? <laughs> <laughs> which I think is pretty funny. So I'm like thinking, yeah, you know, that makes sense. When mm -hmm. you ask, just answer the question. Right. Try not to go and complicate things. Mm -hmm. and, and the best, sometimes the, the best, less is more, I guess, is what right. I'm trying to say. So pressure is not created by the game situation, but how we look at it and how we handle it. Yeah, rationalization is good too for me. I mean, you, you have to also rationalize it and just say, hey, it's baseball. This is fun. You enjoy it. And the and one of the things too is have fun. You know, enjoy it. I I remember my last couple of years where I knew I was coming to the end of my career and I would be in a big situation and I would step out of the box and I would say, I'm gonna miss this. That was that was one thing that I was able to have the mental awareness to say, I'm gonna miss this. And your career is such a blink in time that and I tell kids I tell players I go enjoy it don't forget to enjoy it mm -hmm. you know so when you're up two guys on in the eighth inning two outs sometimes I would step out of the box and go I love this I'm mm -hmm. gonna miss it you know this is fun so you have to use everything at your disposal to be able to relax and execute and that's why I was successful because never take yourself too seriously I mean you know the, the failures never fatal yeah, mm -hmm. in those situations. I mean, to me, there's more pressure of the guy who's in the surgeon mm -hmm. working on someone in the hospital. Sure. I mean, if I make an out, I just lose the game. Right. If he makes an out, someone's going, you know, in the dirt. So right. you have to be able to kind of rationalize what you're doing as well. And all these things are, are things that, as I said, you can't just fall into one mold. You can't fall into it. Always be looking and changing because uh, if the, the, the ability to motivate yourself and focus is fluid. You know, there's not one thing that's going to help work every time. Yeah. I vividly recall when you and Bill came out to the Olympic qualifier um, and you gave that message to the players that, you know what, you don't know how long you have. And I think it like resonated in the hearts of like a Chris Colabello, mm -hmm. you know, and he was, you know, a, a, who is sort of a, an elder player who the younger players look to, but everyone needs to check themselves, Sure, you know, and it's not an easy game, but it, I just love how the fact that you, you could just come into a situation and be such an inspiration and, you know, we beat South Africa as a result of that, mm -hmm. but 
at the end of the day, um, I think you have a way of communicating to players as, as one of their own, you know, like peer to peer. It's not like pedestal, you know, looking at you've been there. You've been in the trenches. Yeah. You've been in the pressure cooker. Well, one of the compliments that I was very blessed to have was even through my other experiences is that when you talk to players, players have this sort of, they know that I know the smell of the locker room. They know that I know that smell. And there's very few guys that they will respect, I guess is the word, because look, and that doesn't mean other coaches don't mean well. I mean, there's mental coaches out there. There's, there's really well-trained sports psychiatrists, you know, guys that studied at Harvard and all these things. And, you know, for me, I tell them though, I speak from the heart, really. I mean, I don't, I'm not a clinically trained psychiatrist or psychologist, or I, I don't know, you know, psychosis and neurosis and, and brain chemistry and all these things that these guys, and I think that's great. I think that's cool. But we also have to kind of bring things down that where we can communicate it and, mm -hmm. and guys can understand. So for me, um, it's just speaking from the heart. Mm -hmm. And I think that gets a good response. And that works for me, too. Because, mm -hmm. and also when I do teach, I say, guys, look, I'm going to give a little a presentation, but I love questions. I love discussions, interaction. I mean, that's what I love most. Unfortunately, it's a little bit of a dated, dated uh, concept, but hey, we, we, you know, that's where we keep going. I mean, you're never going to have a moment of revelation to where you're going to say, oh, it all makes sense. No, it's little moments of happiness and success along the way. Mm -hmm. But the game's always the same, whether an exhibition game or the World Series. So the difference is the mental attitude of the player. Absolutely. And you're funny, it's funny you say that because I mean, that's why we love baseball so much is that it could be a minor league game, major league game, game in Europe. Like it's, if, if baseball is being played with passion, fan, that's what attracts people to the game. It's something I've always been attracted uh, about the game and it's fun. It's fun to go back and watch old games and watch great moments and things because it's, it's part of what makes, makes what, what is part of our makeup. It's part of our history.